The year is about 1909, and Ernest Rutherford and his team, including Hans Geiger of Geiger Counter fame, and Ernest Marsden, are conducting an experiment that will revolutionize our understanding of the structure of the atom. And it's called the gold foil experiment. So they directed a beam of alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil and observed how the particles scattered. So alpha particles are helium nuclei, meaning helium nuclei with a two plus charge. They each consist of two protons and two neutrons. His source for alpha particles was radium. Radium is a radioactive element, and when it decays, it naturally emits alpha particles. So he put radium in a container with a small opening and pointed that opening at our thin sheet of gold foil. Now, this gold foil is surrounded by a detector. It's coated with something that luminesces when alpha particles hit it. So it would just light up and he would visibly be able to see where the alpha particles were hitting. Now, alpha particles are huge in comparison to the electron. They are each about 7,000 times more massive than the electron. So to paraphrase Rutherford, it's as if he was shooting a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper. Now, at this point in time, we have two competing atomic models. J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model, in which negatively charged electrons are embedded in a positively charged pudding, like raisins in a disgusting cake, and Hantaro Nagaoka's Saturn-like atom, in which there is a sphere that's positively charged, surrounded by a halo of negatively charged electrons. Let's think about what would happen if either of these models were correct in this experiment. So, if J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model is accurate, the particles should have passed straight through. Maybe if we're being generous, we could say the trajectory would change a little bit just due to attractive and repulsive forces. Now, what would happen if Hantaro Nagaoka's Saturn-like atom is correct? We could see a case for a bit more of a change in trajectory just because of the separation of charges. However, that's not what Rutherford and his team were seeing. So let's look at a cross section of the gold foil with most of the length of the gold foil out this way to think about what's happening. So what he found is that most of the alpha particles went straight through. That would be consistent with atoms being mostly empty space. They were never around a charge to attract them or repulse them or to change their trajectory in any way. Some of them had a change in trajectory, just a little bit. And that's consistent with just being near a charge and normal electrostatic opposite charges attract like charges repulse forces. But every once in a while, one of the alpha particles is just deflected back at a really sharp angle. That is what was very unexpected. It's like they hit something really, really dense. Rutherford described it as, it's as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So the only way this makes sense is if it hit something really, really dense. So our atomic structures don't hold up anymore. So if you wanna take a moment to pause and come up with your own atomic structure, go ahead and do that now because I am about to show you Rutherford's atomic model. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford proposed the planetary model of the atom. In this model, most of the mass and the positive charge is in a dense nucleus in the center, and electrons, which are negatively charged, are in orbit. You might look at this and think it looks a lot like Hantaro Nagaoka's Saturn-like atom, and I see where you're going with that thought, but the difference here is that there is a lot more empty space. And that is because most of those alpha particles were going straight through that gold foil. So think of this more like mapping with the solar system, with the sun in the middle that's lots and lots of mass, then lots and lots of empty space before you get to electrons in orbit. But you can probably say it with me at this point, this isn't quite right. Opposite charges attract. So the obvious question is, 
why do these not just crash into each other, causing the atom to collapse? And to answer that question, we need the help of Niels Bohr. Thanks for watching Chemistry in a Nutshell. If you feel that I've earned it, please like this video and subscribe to my channel.